Hi, it's Jeff, host of the podcast. My latest author interview will be up in just one moment. I'm not going to ask you to buy anything. I'm not going to ask you to go and review the podcast. What I am going to do is take just one brief moment and ask you to recommend the podcast to just one friend. If you're a writer or if you're someone who just loves books and you love this podcast and the interviews that I do, all that I ask is that you recommend the podcast to just one friend. Thanks a lot. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guests today are Amber Edwards and Justin Scott, husband and wife and co-authors of the new novel, 40 Days and 40 Nights. Best-selling writer Lee Child wrote about the novel, Wonderful, The River, ominous, atmospheric, somehow inevitable, is so much more than just a part of the story. It is the story in all its might and majesty. Very impressive and highly recommended. Amber and Justin, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Well, if someone listening hasn't yet heard about your new novel, 40 Days and 40 Nights, how would you describe the novel? I would describe it as a novel about public service. Oddly enough, it occurred to us when we had finished that virtually all the characters and all the important characters are people in one form of public service, whether it be Army Corps of Engineers protecting the Midwest from the river, or whether it be a preacher or a police officer or a nurse. It's also a novel um, about the weaponization of nature, which is... uh, uh, you know, nature is scary enough these days, and the Mississippi River is certainly a a mighty foe, and it can be a mighty friend. But um, in this case, our villain has figured out a way to weaponize a flood, and the uh, hero, the hero Clementine Price, and her makeshift band of volunteers have to figure out a way to stop that. And I'm curious, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to to collaborate on your first novel and write 40 Days and 40 Nights? Yeah, that's that's a wonderful question. Uh, I think that uh, two things started us off. Uh, A realization that uh, we knew a unique part of America uh, in the Arkansas Delta, and a sense that uh, it had been lured, certainly in novels, and also just a sense that this was a magnificent power to write about, to set a story within. When Amber realized that instead of doing the traditional thriller where the hero parachutes in, saves the town, and goes on to his next adventure, why not make the hero someone who lives there? who has her skin in the game, her stake in the ground. I had, uh, my mother grew up in Dell, Arkansas, and I had spent a lot of time there as a child. And um, when I was a young adult, I had spent a lot of time there uh, with my eccentric cousin, uh, who, who appears in a more sanitized form in this novel. He's the Steve that I wished he had been. But, um, I started to make a film about him and this area uh, back around 2000, and it never panned out because it was just too complicated. And also, I had become part of the story myself, which I didn't like to be. And around that same time, Justin had started writing a novel for the first time, a thriller set in this part of the world. Then that never uh, fully materialized. And Um, In 2017 or 2018, he opened it up again, and I had finished my uh, last documentary, and I uh, had a little time on my hands, and I kept offering helpful suggestions to him, like, gee, why don't you make the hero a female? And gee, why don't you have this? And why don't you do this? And maybe you could have this. And a lot of um, professional writer husbands would have said, why don't you write your own damn book? But um, Justin, you know, generously offered to bring me in on it. And so he, you know, took on a novice 
And um, here we are. You can't see us, but we're actually holding hands and we're sitting side by side. <laughs> well, well I, I'm, I'm curious about that because, Justin, I know that you have um, written over 30 novels and you've collaborated with uh, the best-selling writer Clive Cussler on eight novels. I'm curious, what, what did the writing process look like once you two decided to work together? It was uh, it was a true collaboration. Uh, uh, I did not collaborate with Clive. Uh, we I would pitch him an idea. He'd say terrific. I would write it, and then we would you know go through the manuscript. In mm -hmm. this case, it was definitely going to be a partnership, about which I had very few qualms. Uh, number one, I we've been married long enough. I know her worth work ethic, which is awesome. And I also know that she is uh, a very good writer. Uh, she's even a better writer now, but she was then too, because the editing process of a uh, documentary film is very much like writing. You, you actually are having to, you know, uh, verbalize the story as it were. So anyhow, I didn't have any doubts there. And so we just started talking about the book and laying out a general pattern. And then once that was something we could start to write on, then we would literally say, okay, I'll do this scene, you do that scene. And we would uh, subsequently then show each other the scenes and uh, often act as each other's editor on the scenes and occasionally throw up our hands and say, okay, you try the scene because obviously I'm not doing that good a job at it. I think one of the uh, differences in, in collaborating uh, for me and Justin is that Justin has been a writer for 40 something years. Since the <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, his idea of writing is you sit all alone in your head typing. And I had spent most of my career making documentary films, which is incredibly collaborative. You were always working with a bunch of people. You're always throwing ideas out, throwing out scenes, making scenes, throwing them away, changing them, you know, testing them against everything. So I had, uh, I had no pride of authorship and I fortunately did not allow myself to be censored. So I would come down with my five pages at the end of the day and I would shove them in front of Justin. And, he, you know, it had, I figured if one adjective is good, let's do seven. And he would then take his little red pencil and he would cross out six of those adjectives, but then he would circle the one that was really good. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. There, well, there, there would be an adjective there that was <laughs> priceless. But it was just a matter of clearing the dead wood around it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I'm curious, what kind of research did you two do about the Mississippi River and climate Chain. If you could see us, if you could see us right now, you would see huge nods of the heads. Uh, massive, massive research. Uh, it it turned out that as much as we knew about the area through Amber's family, uh, we did not know enough, near enough, to really do. Uh, this kind of a story, particularly going back to Amber's idea of you're going to start with someone there. So we had so much to learn about the someone. We knew where she had lived. Amber had actually seen the spot uh, before the river washed it away. And we knew her basic career that got her into the ability to be a fairly highly placed young woman uh, in the, uh, the Memphis district of the Army Corps of Engineers, Mississippi Division. And th that gave us, um, a, shall we say, a, a, a base. But then when you get into the page by page stuff, you discover, you don't know anything about this. It is exotic. It is different. It is like totally different than experience. I've written a bunch of sea stories. And what attracted me to the area was it reminded me of the ocean, utterly flat, you know, as far as you could see. Uh, but eyes, on one hand, all boats are the same, but on the other hand, they're all very different. So I had a lot to learn about just the Mississippi boats. One of the things that uh, I found fascinating is that um, a lot of people who are actually in the Army Corps of Engineers in one aspect or another have no idea what this particular Mississippi division is, which is all about the river. And it's about keeping the river in its channels and the water off the farms. And uh, I mean, it truly, it, they are, you know, they have erected these engineering marvels, but the Mississippi River is ultimately smarter 
and it will go its own way and do what it does. And we realized in, in all of this research, and by the way, the Army Corps of Engineers publishes online these wonderful things, and I don't have a science background, and so it was a real test and exercise for me to be able to, first of all, understand what they were talking about in this you know, very technical language, and then figure out a way to explain it. So I figured if I could understand it, then the reader would be able to understand it. Um, you know, just coming up with the right images or the right, uh, you, you know, metaphor for how the immensity of some of these these scenes, these sites are, uh, you know, at one point, uh, Justin was struggling to figure out how, how big was one of these barge fleets. And, you know, he came up with the, with the idea, I think it was something like three baseball, you know, each one was the size of three, uh, baseball fields. And so driving the fleet was like driving the stadium. Um, so that was, I mean, that was challenging. And we also had, uh, fun doing the deep dive of research into the history of the river, going back to the great flood of 1927, mm-hmm. which is, you know, still, it's one of the great traumas of this country and it's it's emblazoned on you know on the souls of so many of the people who live along that river interesting um for those listening who may not know about the flood of of 1927 can you tell us just briefly a little bit about it um it essentially uh it rained it rained for a year uh, and the floods began to uh, really get big, and it was before the Corps had kind of uh, brought everything together in in a coordinated battle with the river, mm-hmm. so that each town and each region was protecting its own area, and that meant that basically their job was to send the water on to the next town, and sometimes they would actually help it along by in the dead of night going and dynamiting the levees of the next town. I mean, very serious stuff. Um, and the, uh, by the, when it finally flooded, it covered uh, literally millions upon millions of acres, much of it which stayed underwater for six months. Wow. Well, I'm curious, are you two planning to write another novel again or uh, together again, or have you started working on another one? We we have um, there's there's quite a backlog here because Justin is just now in the process of finishing the book that he was writing when we met twenty six <laughs> years ago. Um, it's been a it's uh, it's it's been a long time brewing, but we do have a plan for uh, for a, an, another collaboration. This one is is would not be set. Uh, Clementine has saved the world, and so she's going to get to take a rest for a while. But um, this one uh, is set in World War One. I'm sorry, World War Two, and the the heroine is a, an 11 year old girl. <laughs> I believe great. in supergirls. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, so do I. <laughs> I'm curious, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? Writing novels is one of the only art forms that you really learn on your own, that you learn by yourself, which means that it's the one that you learn by doing. So the day that you write is going to advance your career far more than the day that you don't write. Uh, You can find mentors. You can find uh, people to give advice. I've come around to the feeling that the people you really should be talking to with novels, which is to say not talking, but showing your material to, are other readers. And I think that any friend you have as a real reader can give you a lot more at that early stages, in particular of learning how to write, than you could, let's say, by going to school. I, 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 I fear that the going to school is not the best way to do this. Obviously, some people do and do it quite well. My personal experience says that we are better off learning our craft on a daily basis by ourselves. I would only add to that as the as the newbie in this team that um, it, two two opposing uh, concepts. One is don't censor yourself, let it all come out. But once it does, don't be afraid to kill your babies. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 six adverbs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Or for the whole ch- or the whole chapter. But but you know right. get it out and then just be absolutely ruthless. 
in in the in the rewriting. Sure, sure. We we have a saying: you can't rewrite until you've written. Sure. Well, I'm curious, what books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Ah, okay. I've been on an Edith Wharton kick, and um, I've been reading her short stories, and they are such a lesson in in um, in precision and in understated emotional wallops. And also sometimes she will pull an O. Henry uh, turn on you. And, um, you know, she is not afraid to skip uh, 20 years in the middle of a paragraph. Um, she is just so incredibly bold. Um, I'm a huge fan of John Williams, uh, his classic stoner about, uh, which seems like it's a, about a man that nothing happens to, but in fact, it's sort of about the 20th century in America. And then um, I've also been working my way through the John le Carré masterpieces. That's great. I've been rereading the John le Carré masterpieces, and as writers go, he really, really stands up. The, the man is absolutely astonishing. I'm a huge fan of Patrick O'Brien. I've read most of the novels a few times each, and I think he is filled with lessons on how to tell stories. Um, one of the things when I was working with Clive, um, I realized that what Clive had presented me with was the opportunity to do uh, a, uh, a Patrick O'Brien family. Mm -hmm. uh, with O'Brien, it's the ships uh, and the Navy. And uh, with the Isaac Bell series that uh, Clive asked me to write with him, uh, it was the National Detective Agency in 1900. And it was joyous to be able to make a family of people, men and women, that you could bring in and out of the books as time went on. Really, really very satisfying. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about uh, your, the novel that you two wrote, 40 Days and 40 Nights? Well, um, we both have our own websites, okay. <laughs> and mine is amberedwards.com, and Justin's is Justin Scott. Well, it's complicated because he worked uh, – uh, when he started his website, he had a another full-time pen name. So, But just look for Justin Scott author, and, and you'll find him, and you'll get to learn all about his various pen names and his uh, other um, identities. <laughs> few, I think there's a few writing lessons in it also, right? Or, or research lessons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Amber Edwards and Justin Scott, co-authors of the new novel, 40 Days and 40 Nights. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Amber and Justin, thanks for doing this interview. It was a real pleasure talking to you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. You're a very charming interviewer. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. 